Today's scripture reading comes from Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 12. Now war rose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated, and there were no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brothers have been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you, O earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath, because he knows that his time is short. This is the word of God. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking um, about the book of Revelation. Uh, this is kind of like Revelation weekend uh, for our church. Uh, why? Because we have a, a really world-renowned speaker uh, named Dr. Craig Keener, who's going to be speaking in second service. <laughs> So I'm like the opening act and after party <laughs> uh, today. Um, but he is a, an, an amazing scholar. And so if you can actually stay and stick around, I would really encourage you uh, to do that. And he's going to, uh, you know, I don't know how deep dive he's going to do. I, I, from, I saw the lectures from yesterday. Uh, it, it was deep. Those are some deep waters that they waded into. Um, but I believe that it's going to be a very encouraging time uh, for us. But you know, as, as I read, um, and I was just preparing for this message, you know, uh, a thought came to mind. Do you know what this is? This is uh, the Queen Mary. Have you ever seen the Queen Mary? I think I saw the Queen Mary when I was a kid <laughs> on Long Beach. I think it was, it was in Long Beach. Um, you know, I'm not necessarily a fan of, of cruise taking cruises. You know, I feel like it's a moving captive buffet. Um, you know, and so I, I don't know. I, I don't mind the moving or the buffet. It's the captive part that I, I'm not uh, really into. Uh, but the Queen Mary, this was uh, at the time one of the uh, largest. It's larger than the Titanic, faster than the Titanic. It was one of the most luxurious liners and it had the record for like a couple decades in terms of speed how it would go it would, it, it's a trans it, atlantic uh, liner and it was the pinnacle of luxury uh, people uh, boarded the ship and and dined it out uh, and they lived uh, lived up uh, their life in it but what's really interesting about this ship is that during world war ii Everything changed. They converted the ship from a luxury liner that held like a little less than 3,000 people to a, to a troops transport ship that would move 15,000 soldiers across the Atlantic. It was completely shifted. It went from luxury cabins and bedrooms to barrack-style rooms that would hold eight soldiers each. It was completely shifted. And I was reminded of this because this is a picture of when there's war, things change. Priorities change. Uh, this is a picture of uh, chain, the changing life of Americans in times of peace and war. It was. Things shifted. Things changed. Um, women went to uh, the factories. Men went out and served in the armed forces. There's, there's a shift that happened in the lifestyle of Americans. The book of Revelation is a call to the people of God to be overcoming adversity through the battles that they are facing. It's a call to battle. You know, the book of Revelation was written around 95, uh, 96 AD. Okay? Uh, this means that Apostle John, when he 
uh, was writing this book would have been around 90 years old uh, on the island of Patmos, and he was the last of the apostles to be alive, right? Uh, the witnesses of Christ. Uh, remember, I don't know if you remember in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it talks about the gospel and how Paul was saying, there's over 500 witnesses of Jesus' resurrection, you know, that's with us today. And he was talking about those witnesses, and those 500 people are probably long gone now. Jesus died around 30 or 33 AD, you know, depending. Um, so it would have been over 60 years since Pentecost and the founding of the church. You know, to give you perspective, all you old timers at this church, just add 40 years to our church history. And that is the situation of the church in Revelation. It's been a long time to the point that the church, it says in Revelation, has abandoned its first love. Um, things are not what they used to be. You know, as, as I get older, I keep on finding myself saying things like that. Things are not what they used to be. You know, and think about, I always think about like gas prices. Remember when you used to pay for the octane? You guys remember that? I guess not. <laughs> uh, you know, things are not. Remember when a bowl of pho was like $4 a bowl? Oh, I remember that. You know, just, but things are, are different now. Um, so this letter comes as a revelation. And it's a call to the church. It's a call when they really needed it. And things have not changed that much. It's the same. We need this call today. And this is a call to remind the church that it is not over, that there is more to come, and that we must stay vigilant in our expectation in the Lord. This, this whole book is a reminder of that. And you know, a lot of people never get to Revelation. You know, we start off in Genesis, uh, you know, and we never make it out of Exodus. <laughs> you know, a, a, that's, a, that's a lot of people. And so Revelation in, in the back, you know, and we have certain ideas of Revelation. And it does, there's certain parts of it that does make us feel uncomfortable. Um, but it's by design. It's meant to be. But there's certain themes in this book. Today, it's, it's kind of like a, an overview. But there's certain themes that the Apostle John just hammers. He hammers it into the church. And I think these themes are as valid today for you and me as it was uh, a couple thousand years ago. Because he talks about Jesus' expectation for his people. What is his expectation? To be an overcomer. Turn to the person next to you and say, you are an overcomer. This word is repeated a lot in this, this book. And you know, the, the seven churches in, in chapter 2 and 3, uh, the Apostle John brings up these seven churches in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. Uh, you can think of them as kind of uh, the, the last, uh, the bridge, the gateway to Europe. These churches uh, were vibrant. They were established. It's been a while. Um, and, and they have been planted by missionaries who left uh, either willingly or unwillingly from Jerusalem and established these churches. And he goes on and he lists each church and he tells them what their wrongs are, what their problems are, what their sins are. You know, I'm just going to quickly go through Ephesus and famous first, you have abandoned your first love. It's been 60 years. You know, for some of us it's been 20 years. For some of us it's been 30 years. But you've abandoned your first love, the love that you had at first. And it tells them to go back and do the work that you did at first. And then he goes on, to him who overcomes. I will grant to eat of the tree of life. Smyrna. This is an interesting church because this is the only church that he actually doesn't directly criticize. And why? Maybe was, this was compassion because he said, you are about to suffer. <laughs> There's going to be tribulation. 
some of you will be thrown in prison and you're going to be tested. And he says, he who overcomes will not be hurt by the second death, which is the judgment. Pergamum. Okay. And he goes on and he talks about their sins. You eat food sacrificed to idols and practice sexual immorality. And he says, repent. And to those who overcome, I will give the hidden manna. I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone, which no one knows but he who receives it. There's a recognition of who you are. There's a personal, intimate relationship that comes for those who overcome. Thyatira. Seducing, there's Jezebel seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality. It comes again. Eat food sacrificed by idols. But again, to those who overcome, he's going to give them authority over the nations. Allow them to rule. There's a promise okay, that's given to them. Sardis. I know your works. You have the reputation. Now, this is, this is kind of sharp. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Spiritually, they have fallen a long way. But if you overcome, you will confess his name before his father. Philadelphia, I know that you have little power, and yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name he uh, congratulates them. And then he says, overcome. Keep on going. And then I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven and from my God and my new name. And then lastly, uh, Laodicea, and this is a very famous passage, you're lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, And he says, I will spit you out of my mouth. And then he says, he who overcomes, I will grant to him to sit down with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father. So you see a repetition here. Overcome. You can um, translate this conquer, and some versions of the Bible do. Those who conquer, those who overcome. Nikao. This is a present, active participle. This is something that John is looking at the church and he's saying, you must be doing this. This is something we are presently called to do. And he repeats this 17 times. You know, just like Paul emphasizes the word faith in the letters, John emphasizes over the overcoming aspect of faith. And this is for every believer. You know, and, and even in modern culture, you know, Nike is, is where we get this word. Nike, it means victory or, or the goddess of victory. Uh, Nikao, Nike, it's very similar. So what is happening here? As he's repeatedly using this word, overcome, 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 what is he saying? That there's a sense of purpose, amen? That there's an enemy and that there's a battle ahead. This is a reminder to the church. John emphasizes this so much that, there, that it's plain to see that to him that this is an ultimate identity. It's very plain. We are people who overcome. Amen? People who are called to overcome. Um, and it may be because it is real, revealed that we are in the middle of it. That The church at that time is in the middle of battle. And so it says that in today's passage, Revelation 12, 7, Now war rose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. Again in verse 9, And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. So Satan was defeated by Christ on the cross, but that doesn't mean that the war is over. The war is still being waged then. It's being waged. It's still being waged today. 
What are the signs of battle? You know, sometimes when we think about spiritual battle, uh, we, we think about some kind of supernatural, kind of scary or, or some things, but what are the signs that we see of spiritual battle? And I think the most obvious way that we know that there's a spiritual battle happening is the lies of the enemy become prevalent. He is the deceiver of the whole world, it says in verse 12, uh, chapter 12, verse 9. He's the deceiver of the whole world. Um, and he lies about who we are, lies about the purpose of life, uh, and he's distorting the truth of God. And we see this today. Where do we see this? The things which were taken for granted, we see this in today's culture, and we're going to see it more and more. The things which were taken for granted as truth in the past have been crushed, okay? have been crushed under the weight of existentialism, individualism, and the resulting hyper-sexualized understanding of man. Okay? That's kind of a mouthful. Okay? But what is existentialism? That there is no God. No absolute truth. Hence, no morals. No such thing as morals. So there is only subjective experience. And as you know, sex is quite an experience. And so sexualization of everything, these experiences, an experience orientation. So we see that the minimization of truth and the weight of subjective experience is being heightened. And I think there's no other issue that shows it so clearly than the transgender issue of today. And you know, this is affecting our children. Um, and studies are showing that this, it's ex especially affecting our daughters. You know, and I have a lot of those. And so this, I'm very invested in this. Um, there's a study uh, from Psychology Today, she, uh, this article. Uh, it talks about Lisa Littman, uh, and she's uh, a professor from Brown University, and, and she did this study in a recent survey of 250 families whose children develop symptoms of gender dysphoria during or right after puberty. Lisa Lippmann, a physician and professor of behavioral science at Brown University, found that over 80%, look at that, over 80% of the youth in her sample were female at birth. Over 80%. Many of the youth in the survey have been directly uh, exposed to one or more peers who had recently come out as trans. Next, 63.5% of the parents reported that in the time just before announcing they were trans, their children had exhibited a marked increase in internet and social media consumption. We've got to burn these phones. Burn it. Following popular YouTubers who discussed their transition thus emerged as a common factor in many of the cases. She, this is Dr. Lippmann, concluded that what she terms rapid onset gender dysphoria appears to be a novel condition which means new, that emerges, emerges from cohort and cont contagion effects and novel social pressures. From this perspective, ROSD likely exhibits an ideology, which means cause, and epi epidemiology that is distinct from the classical cases of gender dysphoria documented in the DSM, which is their um, you know, conclusive literature. So what do we see here? There is a lie being spread, and it's going forth. And there's a conta contamination effect. There's a social effect happening here. And it's redefining gender. You know, homosexual homosexuality has always been there. Uh, people living or acting as the opposite gender has always been there. But people denying their bio biological identity is a first. Saying that their physical gender is wrong and their perceived gender is right is also very new, at least in mass. This is, but this is existentialism properly lived, actually. This is just existentialism properly lived out. It's experience over everything. 
So we've gone from Pontius Pilate who asked, what is truth? Remember he asked that as he was talking to Jesus. To a generation who claims that there is no truth except our own subjective experience. You know, that's, there are lies being spread and people are be being deceived. And it says in the Bible that the whole world is being deceived and it's continuing. It was happening then, it's happening now. And the Word of God is telling us that there's a battle that's raging out there and we have to be aware of it. We can't just be cruising in our mobile buffet pretending that everything is fine and everything is okay. No, there is a battle, and it's a, a battle for our souls, ourselves. It's a battle for our children. And this is what the book of Revelation is telling us. Be aware. Know what's happening. Okay? And be ready to fight uh, the fight. And we know this because the struggle is real, and not just in this arena. People get really hot and heavy over this topic. But this is just one in so many areas of life that we are fighting the lies. Um, but the struggle is real. This is a real struggle. It is heartbreaking what parents are going through and what kids are going through as a result of Satan's deception of the world. And we should never make light of those struggles um, because the pain is real. Um, and we can feel powerless against it sometimes. You know, when, the, when you're in the midst um, of the struggle, we can become, we feel very powerless. We fall to the lies. Lies or accusations of, of powerlessness and worthlessness. Um, but it's saying, don't accept the lie of powerlessness. Um, people who say, in the midst of the struggle, in the midst of the battle, they say, this is just who I am. I can't learn to be different. I can't change. I can't grow. Um, you can get so discouraged, so discouraged that it hurts to just think about it. And I, I think we've all been there at times. You just want to forget is this what life is, we may ask. But the Word of God says, God did not give you a spirit of timidity, but of power, love, and self-control. And we look at that verse, and some of us may wonder, then where is my power? Where is truth in my life? This is the real battle. And so the book of Revelation is not sugarcoating. It's doing the actual opposite of that. It's saying the battle is real. It's here now and it's coming in the future. And I think that's good. Doesn't, doesn't sound so nice, but it's good. Amen? It acknowledges the pain. It doesn't deny it. And it causes, it's calling us, the book of Revelation is calling us to face it. There is a sense of purpose. There is an enemy. And there's a battle ahead. God calls his people to overcome. He calls us to overcome. Uh, but in the book of Revelation, we first have to focus on who he has overcome to give us this hope. And it says uh, in Revelation uh, chapter 5, that the Lion of Judah has overcome. That there is someone who has done this, and so it tells us, stop weeping. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. <laughs> Behold, the Lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. You know, the verb form of this is different. He, he has overcome. It's an aorist tense, which means it's completed. His overcome and our overcome is different. Ours is participle. It's active. It's we have to overcome. We are overcoming. In, in chapter 5, it talks about uh, Jesus, and he has done it. Amen? He has finished it. He has overcome. He has finished his battle. He has done it. 
and he has overcome. And it raises a question, though, how did he overcome? And it says, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. From every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. So what does it say? He has ransomed us through his death on the cross. Ransom means paid, paid for us. A slave to set them free. Who is he paying? Have you ever asked that question? <laughs> he's paid. He's paid the ransom, but who is he paying? It seems that there's a law that must be fulfilled, that even God must fulfill it. There's a place, there, or there's a price that must be paid. There's something that even God cannot change without suffering for it. This passage says that Jesus' payment has consequences in our lives. He made us a kingdom of priests who shall reign on the earth. So there is a call for us to overcome as well. And he's calling us. So he has overcome, and he's calling us to join him in this overcoming. Um, and how do we do this? Okay, how do we overcome? Chapter 12, verse 11, this is what it says. This is the key to overcoming. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony. And they did not love their life even when faced with death. So what does this mean? What is the blood of the Lamb? How do we overcome with that? It means placing our faith in Christ, in his blood, in his work. Our faith, the object of our faith is Christ. Amen? That's what we have to place our faith on. But at the same time, the word of their testimony. A testimony is a faith lived out. This is not just, yes, I saw what, what Jesus did. No, now my life is living out this faith. This is how we overcome. A, a faith that is dead will not help anybody overcome. A faith that is not lived out will not help anybody because it is not a real faith. And so when it says the word of their testimony help them overcome. It means their faith was to the point where it's real. It came out. Their life was different. Their relationships changed. The way that the perspective of the world changed. They saw the battle and they engaged it and they went, they kept on coming in it. Amen? They kept on going in it. They saw that it was hard. And Jesus is acknowledging in Revelation, it's hard. It's painful. Sometimes there's no hope. Sometimes you feel like you're defeated. Sometimes you feel like there is no end. We don't know. That, there, that, that experience is real, and Revelation says it all. Yes, it is real. But it's calling us to overcome by living out the faith that we believe who we are, we believe who God is, and we believe that he helps us and he, and he, and he, and he encourages us, strengthen us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And that's why I'm here at church today. Amen? That's why I come to prayer meetings. That's why I come with my brothers and sisters. I'm like, I need faith. I need this hope. I need to be challenged. I need, uh, you know, brothers and sisters to lay their hands on me and, and pray for me. And I need to, like, have the power that comes from the Holy Spirit to live the life that he's called me to live today. Um, and lastly, and I think this sounds a little dramatic, but I think at the end of the day, this is true. This is the truth. They did not live their, love their lives. And, and this is a part of faith. I think in the, um, in the church, we've kind of lost this a little bit. It's loyalty to the king. It's loyalty even to death. That's an, the expression of faith that we see in Revelation. And I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you where it says this. It, there, there's pictures of this. And sometimes I think maybe you've seen this, but you haven't kind of put it together. I'm going to help you today. Revelation is a story of allegiance to Christ. It really is that. It talks about in Revelation 17, a great prostitute, Babylon. There's opposing cities. It's like a tale of two cities. The first city is Babylon. And there's a woman was arrayed in purple scarlet, 
adored in gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations. And the impurities of her sexual immorality and on her forehead was written the name of mystery Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Many people are falling to this prostitute. This is a battle. So Revelation is painting a picture. This is the battle that we must face. And you know, recently there's been so much news about pastors falling, like, you know, in, into sexual sin. Uh, it, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's sickening. And it's, it's honestly, tell you the truth, when I look at it, when I, I, I hear this so much, I'm like, oh my gosh. It's kind of unsettling how much of that is going on. And we're just talking about pastors. And, and obviously pastors should never do that, and there should be a higher standard. But we're not even talking about everybody else. <laughs> but this is the challenge. This prostitution, sexual immorality, is being painted as a picture of lack of allegiance to Christ. And that's actually what it is. It's a lack of loyalty to Christ because we see another city. There's two cities in Revelation. There's a new Jerusalem. Then came one of the seven angels who had seven bowls of, uh, full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Two cities. One is filled with sexual immorality. The second one, is a beautiful, pure bride. It's saying, be the bride. Amen? Be the bride. And it's saying, you know what? This is the reality of the world that, that's here today. Don't expect temptation to go away. Amen? Brothers and sisters, don't expect it to go away. It's here. Temptation is here and it's in your face. But the Word of God is saying, that is not an excuse. It's saying, chal be challenged. Overcome it is the charge of Christ. It's the charge of revelation. And I know it's hard. You know, you know I, I thank God sometimes I'm getting old. I thank God sometimes I'm getting old because I remember what life was like in my 20s. And 30, like, you know, like the, the way that the temptations would come so powerfully. It's not easy. It's not easy. And it's not saying that it's easy. But it's saying this is about allegiance. Who are you? Whose bride are you? And even the number 666, you know, this is a... You know, remember like, okay, some of us don't remember the 80s, but you remember ACDC and like playing records backwards and Satan, Satan, Satan. You know, remember that kind of stuff that was just kind of like out there and like, you know, Hotel California and like all these kind of things that were out there in the church. If you grew up in youth group, you were afraid to listen to secular music because it was, it was going to like, I don't know, do something to you. Remember that? Remember that? It's, you know, we don't really talk a lot. You know, my kids are listening to K-pop. I, I, it, it, you know, it, it seems like we don't really think in th those terms anymore. 666, scary. And, you know, there's so many theories about 666. What is that? And, you know, some people said, it's a credit card. Remember back in the days, it's a credit card. You know, and we've given in or something, something like that. But um, it's about allegiance. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand. This is the key. Right hand and on the forehead. Or the forehead. So that no one can buy and sell unless he has the marks. That is the name of the beast and the number of his name. You know, and, and I remember reading this and thinking, that sounds so familiar, this right hand, this forehead. Why? Because the Shema, Deuteronomy 6.4, it's, it's exactly the same. Here is the Lord God. The Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. You shall bind them as a sign on your, on your hand. And they shall be a frontlet between your eyes, on your forehead. This is just 
the imitation. Christ and Antichrist. 666 and the commandment of the Lord. This, what does this show? Why does this kid bind these things on his head and put it on his... Because this shows your allegiance. This shows who you are with. And that is very important in Scripture. And that, we've, in the West, we've kind of made Christianity this moral uh, code. Like, oh, we just got to be good people. It's not just about doing right things. It's about who you are with. Who are you with? Who is your loyalty and your allegiance towards? And Scripture is filled with that and saying, we got to know who, you're, who we're with. And it's with Christ. That's our allegiance. And so the question, who do you belong to? Is it obvious in your life? You know, a long time ago, there was a sister. Uh, she was really funny. That, that newcomer at our church, and, and, you know, she was a funny girl. And, and uh, first, first day she came, and, you know, we were just talking, and she's just like, you know, there's not that many single guys here. <laughs> and I was like, you know, and she's only been there for like, you know, one service. I'm like, how, did, how do you know? You know, and she's like, oh, I could just tell, <laughs> you know? And so she's like, you know, she came, you know, it's, it's funny. And I don't mind it. You know, I don't mind it. Come, look for your wife or husband. Do, do that. Go ahead. You know, come and do that. Whatever, whatever brings you to the, to the kingdom of God, just go ahead and do that. <laughs> you know, and, and, you know, come in. And so, it's, she, so basically this is what she, she just scanned the room. And she could tell. She just knew. Too young, married, too young, you know, something, something, you know. And she just knew in like one service. And I, and I was like, wow. You know, and I, I figured out, you know, she just kind of, she was looking at a lot of hands and things like that. <laughs> you know, and she just kind of knew. She could tell there was a sign. It was obvious to her that certain people were taken. And it should be obvious, amen? Amen? We don't want some ambiguity here. <laughs> We don't want that kind of ambiguity here. Some people are just taken. There's an allegiance. These people already have allegiance. So I'm moving on. And she never came back. <laughs> she never came back. But, you know, um, I, I know who she is and stuff. She's, but, but anyway, that, that reminds me of how that's what this is talking about. Like, it should be obvious to the people of God that we are people who are already aligned. There should be allegiance. That people scan the room, they're like, yep, 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 yep. You scan the room and just people just know that these people are different. Amen? That there is an allegiance to Christ. But the problem is, and the, especially what's in media today, is that, nope, they're the same. What's in media today, nope, they're even worse. They're hypocrites. That's what is being portrayed. But the book of Revelation is calling us um, to overcome. Who do you belong to? Is it obvious in your life? And, and when you look at Scripture, this word overcoming, this is interesting. It's often used in connection to a word we don't like, tribulation. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace in the world. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart. I have overcome the world. It, in Revelation, this happens a lot too. Uh, no time to list it all. But there's an overcoming that the book of Revelation is calling his people to that deals with suffering. And I think there's, we all know it. It's so true that when you're faced with things that you have to overcome, that there is inherent suffering in the midst of it. And those are the hardest things to overcome. Amen? They're the hardest things. And as I was preparing this message and, you know, I just I was asking the Lord, you know, you know, like sometimes I, I um, you know, ask Chat G, GPT, 
Like, give me stories of overcoming. And, you know, it gives me like Helen Keller and, you know, Mandela and things like that. And, and we all know their stories. You know, we read about them and things like that. But so I, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't use stories like that. But I know people. And, and some people came to mind. I was reminded of a sister who was in a marriage with constant emotional abuse. She had a desire to serve the Lord when she was younger, but the constant anxiety in marriage was changing her. Her faith and confidence that she had when she was single was being worn away by the tide of constant yelling and threats. You could see the fear and anxiety in her eyes when you would meet. It was a challenge to her. How can someone who says they are a believer become so angry, so violent, so unstable? How, do I, how did I get into this marriage? She and her husband are overcoming the present participle. Overcoming through a journey of faith. And they are. I was reminded of another sister who was dealing with um, work and social anxiety. You know, she graduated and went to work, and after a couple years, it was just the anxiety was really getting to her. And suddenly, she just decided not to go to work. It was too much for her the relationship with her boss and coworkers, her lack of satisfaction with her job. She always felt like an outsider looking in. She lost the ability to connect with people, which led to more anxiety. So one day she hit a breaking point and decided to stay home and thus began a spiral of isolation, weight gain, economic turmoil. She was passionate about worship and serving the Lord, but mental health issues took a toll and she would become MIA for months at a time, couldn't find her, would show up and then would just disappear. This was a challenge to her. Why can't I get out of this cycle of fear, anxiety, and isolation? I'm a Christian and why do I not have hope? She's overcoming these things through a journey of faith. She is overcoming these things, and now she's helping others who are struggling with depression as well. Lastly, I'm reminded of a brother who's part of my staff, who was coming back from an AMI conference with our people when suddenly immigration wouldn't let him through. After many hours and questions, finally found out that he had been flagged for religious work violations and would not be allowed into the country. He even tried to smuggle himself back into the country by walking through another border in another city with no success. The problem was he had a wife and a newborn child inside the country that he couldn't get back to. That started two years of separation from his wife and his newborn child. This was a challenge to his faith. Why did God let this happen? If God let this happen, what else would he let happen? He and his family are overcoming these things through a journey of faith. Teenager children. Sometimes I think, is God punishing me for the sins of my youth? Who knew that the frontal lobe was so important? You know, but, you know, we all have challenges. We all have things that we are called to overcome 
and you know and some of these a lot of these things we are actually inflicting on ourselves but it says who shall separate us from the love of Christ we are more than conquerors you know this is interesting because this is hyper overcomer it, it says no in all these things okay what to separate us tribulation or distress or persecution famine in verse 37 it says no in all these things we are more than conquerors that phrase more than conquerors is hyper conqueror <laughs> more than conquerors through him who loved us the love of christ is bringing us through these tribulations amen he's taking us don't give up it's saying don't give up don't let go of the rope hold on in faith know that knowing that jesus has gone before us hold on to the rope of faith and keep on going keep on fighting and become one of those who overcome amen one of those who overcome that's what revelation is is telling us and the question is are you ready to join the overcomers are you ready are you tired <laughs> you need more hope we are called to join and that's what this is and because there's a promise for those who overcome there's a promise here and he sits on the throne and said behold I'm making all things new and he said right for these words are fit for faithful and true right for these words are faithful and true and he said to me it is done I'm the Alpha and Omega the beginning and the end I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost verse 7 he who overcomes will inherit these things and I will be his God and he will be my son the new heaven and the new earth it's a picture of a of, of reward for those who do not give in who do not quit who run this race of faith acknowledging our tribulations acknowledging the pain yet running it regardless together as a people of God and so there is a sense of purpose an enemy and a battle ahead God calls his people he calls us to overcome and we overcome through faith in Christ through faith lived out and in loyalty to the king even to death for those of us today who are in the midst of the battle I want you to know that you are not alone and that we are going through this together as a people of God and not just Southland throughout the generations with Ephesus with Pergama with Laodicea we're coming through this together with the Church of God and it's saying and he's calling us come with me overcome with me